in time. So I'm going to talk about the biomechanics of punt kicking. Um, just a quick uh, overview on what the punt kick is. Ball starts in the hand, usually approach of about one to five steps, uh, or up to 20 in, in AFL. Ball's released from the hand and impacts with the foot, usually before it hits the ground. There is one kick that doesn't have that. So that's the drop punt we're looking at. There's many different types of punt kick. There's a field goal. Ball gets dropped, hits the ground beforehand. Uh, there's the bomb, maximum height, to get the ball as high as possible. There's the grubber, which goes straight along the ground. There's also a torpedo or spiral, not dissimilar to, to the bomb, but it's, uh, the ball spins about its long axis to get a bit more distance. So, so many different sports use the punt kick, interestingly. Uh, AFL, which we all know about, hopefully. American football, Gaelic footy. Uh, rugby league, rugby union, and also football with the soccer goalkeeper or soccer with goalkeepers is the punt kick as well. The and soccer kicking is quite strong. In fact, there's many researchers here that have done a lot of the work. Hero, Ewald, um, Thorsten. I think, I'm not sure if I've seen Thomas yet, but uh, a lot of people have done uh, a lot of strong work in soccer, but there's less so for punt kicking. In fact, last science and football, Brian Dawson did mention this, this in one of his keynote speeches that there needs to be more work for this on this kick to be done in Australian football. Uh, there's two important differences between the soccer kick, um, punt kick, that means we really need to examine this on its own. It's, for most of the, co the codes that use the punt kick, the ball is ov ovoid, egg shaped rather than round, so it means that the ball orientation is important. And the second one, and this is one of the major errors that people uh, have in the punt kick, the ball must be dropped prior to contact. So those two key points mean that we need to examine this on its own. So what I'll do in this presentation, the aim will be just to go through uh, the research that we've done at Victoria University since that time, since last Science and Footy Conference, looking at various aspects of the kick. So the first one, we wanted to look at what technical elements were associated with kicking for distance, and it's a reasonable first point of call. We used 28 elite AFL players, AFL being the, the highest level of competition in Australia for Australian football. Players kick for maximum distance. We videoed at 500 hertz and uh, digitised in two dimensions and correlated certain technical factors, or quite a few technical factors, specifically with kick distance to see what factors might be associated with distance kicking or kicking further. The boys kick the, kick the ball about 61 metres or on average that range from down to around 55 and one kicker got out to 79 metres, so quite a long kicking distance. The factors we found were significantly associated with distance. Foot speed was the strongest, uh, followed by shank angular velocity, both of those at ball contact, so the faster they were moving, the greater the distance. Last step length, uh, a bigger last step was associated with a longer distance. And ball position. Now, from a correlation point of view, uh, the height of the ball was correlated, which is interesting. So the higher the ball in the group that we tested, the uh, greater the distance. When we look at it from a regression point of view, foot speed, shank angular velocity uh, still remained, but the foot to ball distance in a horizontal direction was included as well. So it explains 67% of, of the variance. So obviously with ball position, uh, it would be optimal rather than maximal. Uh, you wouldn't, if it gets too far out in front of you, you won't be able to kick it. Same if it gets too high, you're going to kick it up in the air. But it was influential in the group that we tested. One of the very interesting things we found amongst this data was that there was a strong negative correlation between knee angular velocity and thigh angular velocity at ball contact of 0.09. It was very, sorry, 0.9. Very strong, uh, very few outliers in that, that uh, this continuum. So at one end of it, we had what I call the knee kickers. They generated all their speed from the foot speed from uh, knee extension. So at ball contact, the thigh had practically stopped. It wasn't moving forward at all angularly. So it stopped and it was purely the, uh, the knee extending. At the other end of the continuum was the thigh kickers. So they had relatively more uh, thigh angular velocity and relatively less angular velocity. Very importantly, there was no difference in distance between the styles, so both styles were used and used effectively by the players that we tested. 
There were a couple of key technical differences between the, the continuum styles. The, on the left hand side, as you look at it, the minimum knee flexion angle uh, in the knee kickers was, uh, was smaller. So basically they flex the knee more in forward swing. It makes sense that that would give them more range of motion to which develop greater ball speed, uh, speed of ball contact. The thigh kickers, on the other hand, used a more or adopted a more flexed hip angle at ball contact. The hip range wasn't actually significantly different for these two groups, but um, they did get a slightly different contact position. So perhaps getting more, allowing them to develop, to, to develop more speed through greater range of motion. Sorry, not greater range of motion, but getting the, uh, that leg in a slightly different position. So that was the two key bits. Probably another, this didn't come out statistically, but one of the interesting things I was working with this team at the time, the thigh kickers tended to uh, have more hip and groin problems. It wasn't uh, a clear cut one, but there was about of the six players out of, out of the 28 who had problems, five of them came from that end of the continuum, but although there was one, probably the worst one was at the other end. So we thought it might be, <coughs> excuse me, an influencing factor in hip, hip injuries. Uh, certainly worth looking at in the future. So that was two-dimensional two analysis, and particularly with the AFL kick and probably now with Rugby League and Rugby Union, that the 2D analysis lends pretty well because it is largely planar, the movement. But there is some 3D stuff, and it certainly needs to go that way, and we shifted towards that um, a couple of years ago. Looking at 3D, and we also looked at forces at the ground and at the support leg. So what we have here is a typical force curve. Green line being the vertical force. Vertical forces, three to five times body weight landing, really dependent on the approach speed. In the case of the rugby codes, typical approach is only going to be three or four steps. You need to get the ball away before you get tackled. In AFL, you can go a lot faster because you can get into open space. And when we found the guys were running faster, largely related to approach speed, the uh, vertical forces went up. And here's our horizontal ground reaction forces. Mediolateral side to side forces were very variable between players. They were quite distinctive, but very variable which, between players, uh, which is quite interesting. There was a fairly distinctive pattern um, has been shown in soccer by a number of studies. Uh, but because our, our approach angle is straighter than soccer, it seems that this one changes. And so we're looking a little bit more at that one. Also trying to link that in with balance to see if there's a, a correlation or an association there. Interestingly, in the uh, AP, only breaking forces. This is not this particular kick, but this is one of the kicks. You can see everything's below that zero line. So all the forces on the landing foot underneath here were going backwards. Nothing was going forwards. There is sometimes we talk about in coaching, I'm also a specialist kicking coach, and I'll, I'll uh, actually use it sometimes myself, but we talk about kicking through the ball, or particularly uh, using that support leg for a propulsion. It doesn't actually do that at all. Um, much the same as, uh, as the findings in soccer from Adrian Lees uh, and others, all breaking and no propulsive stuff whatsoever. We correlated this stuff between, uh, so, sorry, high foot, sorry, foot speeds between, uh, with ground reaction forces and higher foot speeds correlated with a more extended support leg knee through the, through the stance phase. So, Support leg knee here. This one more flexed. This one a bit more, a bit straighter. So it wasn't a range of motion. It wasn't a case of them sagging down more. It was actually hitting the ground with a, with a straighter leg and maintaining it. Two other things that were correlated with higher foot speeds. One was uh, greater peak braking force, which we talked about a minute ago. Also, the greater slowing down of the center of mass, and those two were themselves related. Uh, the greater slowing down of the centre of mass has also been found in soccer and in cricket fast bowling to uh, help with, with uh, speed in those sports as well. A couple of possible reasons for why this might be happening and the soccer and cricket studies also came up with the same, same ideas. Better balance possibly, um, more support for the, the kick leg to generate power 
a strong pillar from which to work off is a possible reason. Could also be a better transfer of energy from the approach, so approach, getting that approach speed, which you've generated a lot of energy from, transferred through, getting it into the kick leg. So it's the ground reaction forces. We've also had a look for kicking for distance. Uh, what happens under fatigue? This is a fairly new study. We're still working through this one, but we had 11, so far we've got 11 senior uh, elite players. They did maximal kicks. We did a 3D evaluation of it. They did it before and after a fatiguing protocol uh, specific to AFL. What we're finding is that there's a shift to greater trunk axial rotation. You can sort of, this is an example, by way of example, more trunk axial rotation tends to result in a this sort of a crossover follow through position. We saw a lot more of that happening uh, in the, uh, the fatigue guys. So the more tired they got, the more they started to swing the pelvis around to generate that speed. And as a result, more work was done at the hip, both in rotation and flexion. So there was a shift strategy, or certainly a shift in movement pattern. And the knee angular velocity tended to drop down at ball contact due to fatigue, due to, we believe due to that fatigue. It's got important implications for training this one because um, in a lot of the sports, the kicking session may be done um, in rugby league, certainly the teams I've been associated with, we always do it before training. In AFL, it's all the way through. But uh, in doing it before training, when you're not under fatigue, you may be practicing a skill that's slightly different to the one you're going to be performing in games under fatigue. So something to consider in terms of training to make sure kicking under fatigue. To impact. Second, second big area that we've had a look at is, is impact characteristics between the foot and the ball during kicking. Uh, as you saw with the 2D analysis, we're looking at around 60 to 70 percent of the variance being explained by the kinematic measures that we're looking at. But obviously there's variance not explained and we think that, uh, this is not just our idea, a lot of people consider that the nature of impact is where that extra bit of uh, variance is, is taken up by. Uh, Dean most important from an AFL kicking development committee point of view, which I'm on recently. Um, we're developing new coaching guidelines for, for punt kicking and impact was the, the point at which we started. This has been a strong focus of research in soccer once again. Um, uh, there's a number of uh, people in the room who have done a lot of great work in soccer. So we're trying to do this also with, with AFL and with uh, rugby league and union. So overall what we've done is had a look at a 2D high speed video, high speed video over here, usually around five or 6,000 hertz. We've compared different things, we've compared distances, uh, 30 to 50 meter kicks. We preferred, we've uh, compared preferred and non-preferred legs, seniors and juniors, and also get different kick types in league and union. A bit of a summary of the findings. We've found that the ball travels about 20, minutes, 20 centimetres on the boot. If you have a look at the picture, that's basically the leftmost foot is when uh, contact first begins, here, and the rightmost is where the ball releases. So the ball moves quite a long way, about 20 centimetres. Similar, similar things were happening with soccer. You can see that shank moves a long way as well. It goes through about 13 or 14 degrees. The average force during impact is very high. On average, it's about... Uh, a thousand newtons or a hundred kilograms, just to give you an idea for, for those not familiar with dealing with forces, about a hundred kilograms, give you an idea about the weight of a heavy person. But it can be as high as 2,500 newtons or 250 kilograms, which uh, Hero's found with his work in soccer, and we've just briefly started doing this ourselves with, with punk kicking, finding similar, similar values. Sorry, I haven't put in my work results here, but work's done on the ball. But the main implication for this being happening is this potential, potential for muscle, muscular contraction to influence the kick. So you can see the knee extending here quite a bit. Is the quad, quadricep group working through that, that point to change the point of kick? There's a bit, bit of contention at, um, on this one. Some people think it's more related to, simply related to foot speed. Um, my thinking is that it is, there is some ability for muscular force to be applied to the ball to change things. It does start, we were finding changes under fatigue which suggests that potentially that is a, a muscular thing.